We are going to have a total of six talks in this session. Uh, the first one is by uh, Lorenzo Graffi, Gregor Leander, Christian Rechberger, Tianyel Setschan, Friedrich Wiemer on WT Distinguishers for AES. And Lorenzo is giving the talk. Um, so join me in welcoming Lorenzo. And Lorenzo, the stage is yours. So thanks, Maria, for the introduction. Just share the screen. Do you see the presentation? No, I don't see it. Yeah, it's there now. Okay. I would like to start this introduct this uh, presentation by recording the concept of um, open key distinguisher. So an open key distinguisher uh, is um, an attack in which the attacker either knows or shows the key that instantiates the target cipher. So this kind of attack makes sense if the block cipher is used in a mode of operation um, that aims to construct, for example, an hash function. So in an hash function, we don't have any secret key material, so the attacker either knows or can show the secret key. So the goal of an open key distinguisher is to discover a property of the attack cipher that holds with a probability that is higher for, the, for an ideal cipher. In our paper, we focus on AES. And in particular, we propose uh, a nine round chosen key distinguisher for uh, AS 128 and a 12 round chosen key distinguisher for AS 256. Both these distinguisher are in the single key model. So this means that uh, the properties uh, doesn't uh, require any relative keys. And they are based on the multiple of n property, which is a generalization of the multiple of eight property proposed at Theorip 2017. So in this brief presentation, I would like to recall how we set up these uh, chosen key distinguisher. So we use the uh, strategy that is quite common in the literature. So first of all, we uh, describe the real property. Then we show that uh, for, the block, for the block cipher instantiated with uh, uh, the chosen key, we are able to construct the set of plain text and ciphertext that satisfy uh, the required property. And in order to do this, we use an inside out approach. And finally, for the case of uh, an idea cipher, uh, we proved that, or we have proved that uh, um, there is no efficient strategy that allows to set up these, uh, to, to construct this set of plain text artifacts with the required property. So in order to do this, I recall some results that we propose in the paper. So first of all, I introduced the concept of uh, invariance of space and of uh, wikis for AS128. Uh, the, the invariance of space is defined in this way. So it's the set of uh, 2 to the 64 texts where the fourth and the fourth column are equal and where the second and the fourth columns are equal. This uh, subspace in, is invariant for, uh, the key, uh, for the key gas AS round and uh, is mapped into a coset of the same subspace uh, if, the, if the key is a wiki. So and, uh, a key is a wiki if it, if, uh, it belongs to, uh, into this set where uh, the keys uh, have all, where the, 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 all the columns are equal. So using this uh, subspace, we can uh, generalize the multiple of eight property. In particular, consider five round of uh, AS128 without the final mixed column operation. If we start with uh, the subspace of two to the 64 uh, chosen plain text in this invariant subspace IS, and if we consider the number of different pair of ciphertexts, which are equal uh, in um, in certain byte, then we can prove that uh, this number is always a multiple of two with probability one, independently of the details of the S box uh, and of the mixed column matrix. Uh, obviously with the assumption that the key is a wiki. If the bytes uh, are uh, um, aligned in an anti-diagonal or in more anti-diagonals, then we can prove a stronger property, in particular that the previous number is a multiple of 128 for five rounds of AS, and uh, it is a multiple of two for six rounds of AS. So similar properties hold also in the backward direction. So we can use these uh, multiple of n properties to construct the chosen key distinguisher. So the goal of our chosen key distinguisher is the following, is to find a set of two to the 64 plain text and ciphertext that satisfy the, the following properties. So the number of different pair of plain text that are equal in any combination of, of byte is a multiple of two. The number of different pair of ciphertext that are equal in any combination of byte is again a multiple of two. And uh, if, if this byte form a diagonal for the plain text or an anti-diagonal for the ciphertext, we require that uh, uh, we require the multiple of 128 property. So using this property, we can construct a nine round distinguisher for AS128 
and a 12 round distinguisher for AS 256. And in both cases, the number of wikis is 2 to the 32. So just to have an idea of the proof, so let's focus on uh, nine round uh, AS 128. So the idea is to show the four sub key in the set of wikis and to consider two to the 64 text uh, in the invariance of space IS. So we define the plain text as the four round decryption of this text and the ciphertext as the five round encryption of this text. So in this way, we can have multi the multiple of n property both on the plain text and on the ciphertext. Now, in the case of an ideal cipher, if we just pick up to the 64 random plain text or ciphertext, and ciphertext, the probability that the multiple of n property is satisfied is quite small. So approximately to the power of minus 100,000. So in the paper, we evaluated other strategies, but we, did, we haven't found any uh, efficient strategies to construct this set of plain text and ciphertext that satisfy the required property. And so we conjecture that there is no efficient strategy to prove the required uh, multiple of n property both on the plain text and on the ciphertext for the case of an ideal cipher. So that's all for my presentation and thanks for your attention. Uh, thanks Lorenzo. So let's jump on quickly to the next paper which is by uh, Tsui Ting Ting and Lorenzo Grassi as well but I think Ting Ting is going to give the presentation which is on algebraic key recovery attacks on round reduced ZOOF. Ting Ting Please share your screen and join us on the stage. And don't uh, forget to switch to full screen when you present. We don't hear you yet. I think you might be muted. Now it works. Eight. Yeah, thanks for your uh, introduction. I'm Ting Ting. Uh, I'm going to give a short talk about our paper, Algebraic Key Recover Attacks on Reduced Round Zoof. And uh, this is a joint work with my colleague, Lorenza. Uh, let's start by introducing the valley construction. Uh, it was uh, proposed on uh, Tosca. 2017, and it is an efficient parallelizable permutation-based construction. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, it has uh, mainly two uh, uh, comp components. One is the permutations, including PB, PC, PD, and PE, and a Another component is ruling function like LFSR or NLFSR. From another point of view, the construction has clear three parts. The first part is the mask derivation. Uh, the secret key is padded into a string and then handled to uh, produce the uh, input mask K and output mask K prime. And the second part is the compre uh, compression layer. It is used to handle the message parallelly. And the last part is the expansion layer. And it is used to uh, generate the uh, data stream parallelly. Uh, Zoof is an instantiation of, uh, uh, of a valid construction. In our work, we will reduce, uh, recover its key uh, by just uh, considering the expansion layer. Uh, in this layer of Zoof, uh, the permutation is the six round Zoof with only 384 base state. And the ruling function is an uh, and LFSR, uh, although we don't know the exact uh, value of S, but we know all input SI come from the same S, and there is a strong relationship be, uh, among SI because of the slow confusion and diffusion of ruling function. So we can build a distinguisher on uh, one round or two round zoof with the probability one by using a strong relationship between SI and SI plus three. 
with this distinguisher, uh, we, we can uh, use many uh, output pair, uh, CI, CI plus three to uh, uh, decrypt, uh, to uh, verify this distinguisher so as to recover the secret key. There are some uh, techniques in the key recovery phase in the attacks on Zoof with uh, one round or two round sudo. Uh, the first technique is very uh, uh, traditional, just uh, to recover the key by uh, guessing KB's part by part, uh, part by part to verify the distinguisher. And the second technique is to build linear equation. Uh, for uh, with each output pair. Uh, as a result, we can uh, use many pairs. We can build a linear equation system. So we can solve it uh, by the Gaussian elimination. Similarly, in the text on Zoof with uh, three or four round Zoodoo, uh, we can also build a equation system based on algebraic expressions. Uh, however, in, in this uh, system, the degree is larger than two, so it is hard to solve. Uh, yeah, to, come, uh, to overcome this problem, we uh, transform such system into linear one by ending uh, new variables to replace the monomials uh, with degree, a degree with uh, larger than one. Uh, it is also called the linearization technique. Yeah, our attacks are summarized in this table. From this table, we can see that first. Uh, our attacks are independent with the compression there. And the second, the attacks on Zoof with one round and two round sudo is practical. Uh, Besides that, the attacks on uh, Zoof with the three or four round sudo has been verified by experiment, ex experiment uh, on a toilet version Zoof. Uh, 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 finally, we also uh, proposed a higher order differential attack uh, to improve the original one. Yeah, that's my uh, short report. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Ting Ting. Um, we have another talk on cryptanalysis upcoming, which is by Ji Fu Lei, Chang Wan Tao, Zhou Chu Ning, and Ting Tian Yo on the improved related key differential cryptanalysis of GIFT. And Fu Lei is going to give the talk. So, can you see my screen? Yep, but please switch to full screen before you start the presentation. Okay. So, hello, I'm Ji Fu Lei, and this talk is about related key and single key differential attacks on GIFT. Firstly, I will give an overview of our work. We proposed the first 25 round attack on GIFT64 utilizing a related key rectangle attack model. And for GIFT128, the previous best results is the 26 round single key differential attack. In our work, we marginally reduce the time complexity, and we also propose the longest related key attack on GIFT128, that is, the 23 round related key rectangle attack. The main idea of Bomran attack is to attack long round cipher with short round trials. The target cipher is decomposed into the upper part E0 and the lower part E1. Suppose that E0 has a differential trial alpha to beta with probability P, and E1 has a differential trial gamma to delta with probability Q, then the probability of the boomerang distinguisher will be P square Q square. Boomerang attack is an adaptive chosen plane test and cipher test attack, while rectangle attack is a chosen plane test attack. 
and the distinguishing probability is p square q square multiplied two to the minus n, in which n is the block length of the target cipher. Sandwich attack is proposed to deal with the dependency between the trials over E0 and E1. The target cipher is decomposed into three parts, and the middle part, EM, handles the dependency. Generally, EM will be a one ROM or two ROM switch. The probability of the bone run distinguisher can be increased by considering multiple choices of beta and gamma. Suppose that there are U trials over E0 and V trials over E1. Then each combination of L0i and L1g can possibly contribute to the distinguishing probability. We define the clustering of the related key differential trials utilized in an R-ROM related key boomerang distinguisher as all combinations of L0i and L1g. And due to the limitation of computing, we only care about trials with probabilities no lower than two to the minus BCR0 over E0, and trials with probabilities no lower than two to the minus BCR1 over E1. We hope to increase the probability of the related key boomerang distinguisher by searching the clustering of the trials. And to do this, firstly, we need to consider how to search related key differential trials with high probabilities. We propose algorithm one based on Massey's algorithm to search related key differential trials with high probabilities. And based on algorithm one, we propose algorithm two to search boomerang distinguisher with high probability. We find related key differential trials of gift for up to 15 rounds, and the results marginally update the lower bounds of the weight of the optimal related key differential trials. We propose algorithm two to automatically search boomerang distinguisher with high probability. And it's obvious that not all combinations of beta and gamma can contribute to the distinguishing probability. And the incompatibility between gamma, uh, between beta and gamma is covered by the BCT or VDT. We found a 20 round boomerang distinguisher for gift 64 and construct a 25 round related key rectangle attack. We also found a 19 round boomerang distinguisher for gift 128 and construct a 23 round related key rectangle attack. And we also improved the time complexity of the 26 round single key differential attack on gift 128 by searching the clustering of the single key differential trio with fixed input and output difference. And that's all, thank you. Thanks, Fule. Uh, our fourth talk is uh, on Boolean polynomials, BDDs, and uh, compressed right-hand side equations, connecting the dots, dots with CryptoPath. It's by JP Inroy, Nicola Kost, and Harvard Adam. And I think JP is going to give the talk. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I assume you can all see the right screen. Yeah, excellent. Um, yes, so um, this talk is uh, basically a highlight reel of our paper. So just let's get started. Uh, binary decision diagram is a rooted directed, directed acyclical graph with labeled nodes. It has a zero and one terminal nodes and decision nodes, uh, which are labeled with variables. Each edge has a zero or one value, and choosing an edge out of a node is the same as assigning that value to the associated variable. Um, BDDs and Boolean polynomials are connected. You can build a BDD based on the ANF from, uh, uh, sorry, of the associated po Boolean polynomial, or vice versa, build the ANF from a BDD. And you do this through the use of Shannon expansion. Uh, on the right hand side here, you see the uh, relation between a parent node and a children node in terms of Shannon expansion. And then we gave an example of this small BDD. 
the ANF associated with the root node is the uh, uh, polynomial, polynomial, polynomial polynomial associated with the BDD. Uh, we then would on to make the point that we only need three modifications on the results of a BDD, sorry, on the rules of a BDD to transform it into a compressed right side equation. Namely, we associate the variables with um, levels instead of individual nodes. We remove the zero terminal node, and then we allow for linear combinations instead of only single variables to be labels. And uh, this means that for us, a very important question to answer is what is the solution set of the compressed right side equation? So since one path can be thought of as uh, assigning or making one linear, linear equation system. We can make one uh, equation system for each path. In this case, we have three, and we have three solutions. And the solution set of a compressed right side equation is thus the union of these three solutions. Uh, after that, we uh, introduced or talked briefly about some of the important operations on compressed right side equations, the swap, the add, and level extraction. Uh, now, with the basics underdone of compressed right side equations, uh, we went on to modeling ciphers and how we can use it for, the, for that uh, occasion. And for modeling, we start by assigning variables and combinations of these variables as output bits and input bits to the S-boxes. And these linear combinations are given by the uh, linear layer of the primitive. These linear uh, combinations and variables uh, then become the labels for the levels of the compressed right side equation, while the graph part of it, the right-hand side part of it itself, is based on the specifications of the S-box. So in this case, we're using low MC as an example. And you see that we have, uh, for one, or each and every input output pair in the S-box specification will be a path through the graph in the compressed right-hand side equation. The next step is to do this for all the instances of S-boxes in the primitive. And this may, uh, gives us a system of compressed right-hand sides. And uh, we call this a SOC. And this uh, one SOC models one instance of the primitive. Now, that is how we can model a, a cipher or a primitive. Now we want to try and attack it afterwards. Uh, and solving um, a SOC is essentially trying to find the solution set of the SOC. And the solution set of the SOC is the intersection of, of the solution sets of all the individual compressed right hand side equations that the SOC is made up of. Uh, since there can be hundreds of these, the challenge is to find this set. Uh, to show how we can do this, we gave a very small SOC with only three compressed right side equations and three linear dependencies. Uh, linear dependencies are very good because linear dependencies are not good, but they they help us in the sense that they give us inconsistent paths. And we know that an inconsistent path is not part of any solution set, so we need to get rid of them. Uh, we do this by what we call linear, uh, linearly absorbing this linear, de linear dependency, which essentially is just a series of add and swap operations that will re result in uh, the special case where you have a constant as a linear um, combination, in this case a zero, actually always is a zero, and then you can just extract that level out of the compressed, side, compressed right inside equation. Uh, we do this for all the compressed right-hand side equations in the SOC. We join them together and then we restore all the linear dependencies. And that means that the uh, resulting solution, uh, solution set for this compressed right-hand side equation is actually also the solution set for the SOC. The caveat of our approach is that solving a SOC is very memory intensive and we usually run out of memory when we do this. Uh, lastly, we moved on to, or we talked about CryptoPath. Uh, CryptoPath is our early stage research tool for man manipulating systems of compressed right side equations. Uh, of course, it have all the operations you expect of it, but we also have a, a key feature, which is that you don't need to, to give us the SOC yourself. You just give us a reference implementation and we'll turn it into a system of compressed right side equations for you. The long-term goal for CryptoPath is to become a useful tool when designing and, and trying testing primitives. Um, we're not there yet, I'm afraid, uh, but we're still choosing to go public already because we believe that tools become better with the use of feedback. And also uh, we see that it would be very nice to try and standardize this reference implementation so it can be useful across several tools and not just a single one. A uh, good example is that unfortunately, uh, we cannot use the reference implementation from CryptoGuff uh, Cryptograph is, by the way, the, um, the tool that gave us this idea in the first place. Uh, we needed a more generalized to, version of this reference implementation to, to, for us to work, uh, but it would be nice to have it standardized. 
And then lastly, we gave some uh, thoughts or ideas of where we can go from here on. For instance, other ways of modeling different primitives, um, setting up for different kind of attacks, or trying to perhaps improve the, uh, the one we already have with, for instance, a better solving algorithm that yields less memory consumption. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, JP. Uh, before we head to the next talk, maybe a brief request for the audience. I'm sure you have some questions, so please go ahead and either post them on Zulip or post them in the chat, or feel free to speak up afterwards in the uh, discussion session. Um, so the next talk is going to be on warp, which is uh, revisiting generalized cycle networks for lightweight 128-bit block ciphers. Um, the paper is by Supadip Panik. Bao Chenchen, Takanori Sobe, Hirayasu Kubo, Yufu Kang, Kazuiko Mimatsu, Kosei Sakamoto, Naoshiba Ta, and Maki Shigeri. And the talk, I think, is given by Kosei. Kosei, uh, the stage is yours. Uh, hi. Thank you for your introduction. So, uh, this talk is about our paper, uh, our revising generalized tracing network for right right 128 block ciphers. So this is a joint work with all these ciphers. So since proposed the first right right block cipher present, so many numbers of right right block ciphers have been proposed. Uh, as the first generation right right block ciphers, uh, some primitives for the small area were proposed. So these works are very contributed to the development of field of the right right block ciphers. However, the if block cipher has a 128-bit blocks with a 128-bit key, uh, there are some mates. Uh, for example, the block cipher must guarantee enough security for burst attack and possible to directly replace with AES-128. So from these motivations, so our goal is to build a 128-bit block cipher based on GN with significantly small both encryption only and unified AD circuit than existing ciphers. So for achieving a small unified AD circuit, uh, we employ GN-based uh, ciphers. So in our paper, uh, we propose a new 128-bit block cipher named WARP. So WARP is 128-bit block cipher with a 128-bit key uh, based on type 2 GFN uh, with 32 branch. And WARP require uh, only uh, 760 gates for a bit CR encryption only circuit. So it's a new circuit record of a 128-bit block cipher. So this is a specification of WARP. So as mentioned before, a WARP is a 128-bit 128-bit block cipher with a 128-bit key. So the round function is 41. Uh, the round function is based on type 2 GFN with 32 branch permutation and 4 bit test box. So 4 bit test box is the uh, same as box as these are used in Midori. So round key is XOR after the S box. Uh, permutation is 32 branch permutation and it is omitted at the last round. So as for the key schedule function, so uh, the original key is divided into two 64 bit halves. And then they are alternately inserted into the round function for every round. <laughs> so I explained the design rationales of WAP. So since our goal is to build our 120 bit block cipher with significantly small circuits. So our four bit test box is more uh, suitable than 8-bit test box for our design in terms of area, uh, delay, and energy. So, however, finding a good started branch permutation is much difficult because the number of, uh, number of candidates were too large. So, therefore, our challenge is to find a good started branch permutations for, difference, uh, di for diffusion and the number of active boxes. So to solve this problem, so we convert the GFN type structure into the L block like structure. So moreover, we limit 60 branch permutations to a two same eight branch permutations. So that is helpful for beta hardware implementation. So by this conversion, so we can reduce the number of candidates to about uh, two to the power 19. So then we find a construction with 10 round for diffusion and 40, uh, 64 active focuses over 19 round. So this is a summary of our security evaluation of WAP. 
So in our evaluation, the impossible differential attack is the most efficient attack, and it is expected to the work up work for up to 32 round. So this is a serial implementation result. So this table shows our performance value in terms of area. So uh, this is round based implementation results. So similar to uh, serial implementations, our app require a smaller area than other ciphers. So moreover, our app achieve a notably low energy consumption. So this is a software implementation result on 8-bit AVR. So our app achieve a competitively small core size and extremely low RAM consumption on 8-bit microcontrollers. So finally, so I show a uh, conclusion of my presentation. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Kose. That uh, leads us to our final talk of the session, which is uh, by Anna Broy, uh, Elena Andreva, and Ferdinand Sauer on interpolation cryptanalysis of unbalanced cycle networks with low degree round functions. And I think Anna is presenting the paper. Can you hear me? Yes, but we don't see your screen yet. Okay. Um, you should see the screen now. Looks good, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, very briefly about uh, our work on interpolation cryptanalysis of unbalanced Python network with uh, low degree round function. And uh, this is uh, targeting uh, a block cipher and hash function called uh, GMMC. So this, uh, this block cipher is a member of a particular class of uh, designs which are uh, novel designs in many ways and targeted for um, multi-party computations and zero-knowledge applications. And the algebraic analysis is particularly very much relevant due to the inherent algebraic design approach in all these ciphers. And uh, the problem really uh, originated from last year's uh, SAC article by Lee and Prenil, uh, who showed how to use low-memory interpolation cryptanalysis to uh, analyze uh, round radius MIMC and Feistel MIMC structures. And uh, they left the open question that uh, how to apply their analysis or extend their analysis in the case of GMMC, uh, which has this unbalanced Feistel network structure underneath. And uh, the main issue, which uh, I can only speculate, is that uh, their uh, analysis is, wasn't directly applicable. Of course, they don't say it uh, explicitly. Uh, so I'm going to briefly outline the idea of the cryptanalysis first. Uh, so for any block cipher, if you consider it as a function, uh, then you can find a polynomial of certain degree d. So the idea is to, that you look at, in, in normal interpolation attack, you will try to find a representation of the whole polynomial. But in low memory interpolation attack, we are actually interested in uh, the second highest coefficient. And once you find this one, this can also be seen as a function of the secret key k. Uh, so on one side, if you obtain this uh, polynomial q, uh, which is the second coefficient with its algebraic form, and on the other hand, you can obtain the, the coefficient value of the coefficient through low memory interpolation, uh, then you have an equation. It's a polynomial equation, but nevertheless, if you can solve it, then you can find the value of the secret key. And this is really the essence of the uh, algebraic analysis. So what we target here is the unbalanced Feistel network where we, all the, a major part of the technicality went into uh, how to obtain this uh, polynomial Q of K. And then uh, the low memory interpolation, uh, uh, low memory interpolation analysis to find the second highest coefficient was a straightforward thing to do. And then uh, to solve this equation, we actually proposed a root finding method instead of uh, GCD, which was mainly used in the previous work. 
Um, and I'll tell briefly why that is uh, more useful. So to very briefly give you the idea of the unbalanced Feistel network, we consider these are the two cases. One is with expanding round function on the left hand side and another one is with uh, uh, contracting round function on the right. And we consider the two cases where the, the round key, uh, sorry, the, the master key is either uh, one single key, which is uh, the field element, or it comes from, uh, it, it's constructed from two field elements. And uh, as the title suggests, we consider a low degree uh, round function. And if you look at the GMMC construction, then uh, this is uh, simply XQ, which is uh, definitely fitting uh, to this low degree uh, assumption. Um, so what we do is that in uh, our case, we cannot take the polynomial which is represented by the entire block cipher output, so we'll choose a specific branch uh, to get the polynomial, and uh, for the adversary's uh, convenience, uh, she can choose the lowest degree uh, output polynomial. And uh, this can be constructed by fixing all but uh, one input branch, that means that will be the variable input. and. Uh, so as I said before, the, the first problem is to obtain this uh, algebraic form of the secondized coefficient, and this is uh, where uh, most of analysis uh, goes into showing that how you can obtain this form and what is the complexity for obtaining this algebraic form. Um, and because we are only interested in the secondized coefficient, we only look at that term and find the uh, find the value of it using uh, low memory interpolation. So this is roughly the uh, expression of the polynomial where beta is, a, beta is again a polynomial in K. And uh, from this, we actually uh, find the key by using root finding algorithm. And uh, by changing the fixed inputs, you can actually construct two polynomials, Q and Q prime, and then you can use the GCD method to find the key also. But as we show in the toy example in our article, that this actually costs you more because you have to uh, repeat the process twice. Uh, whereas in uh, root finding algorithm, you can get it uh, get it with one uh, such process. Although in theory, root finding algorithm has a higher uh, complexity than GCD algorithm. Yeah, in practice, this becomes more useful, or at least for the cases uh, for which even GMMC uh, is constructed. That means the field sizes. Um, and then we also go ahead and use this all this analytical result to find an attack on the hash function. So the idea here is that uh, we assume that one of the, the rightmost branch is actually used for computing the hash output. Uh, so if you look at this figure, so consider this is the first block where the message m0 was ins inserted. So first we take the hash value of a two block message m0, m1. And suppose this is the uh, this is the figure after the first uh, message block was processed through the sponge um, sponge instantiation through uh, fixed key UFN. We get a chaining value considering uh, which uh, which is uh, made of h zero up to h t, and then I add the variable message here, and then another block of UFN with fixed key will be uh, executed. And here, because this is only the variable part, I can again construct the polynomial at the end. And this will correspond to some m0 prime uh, and x, uh, which is the variable block. And because I want to find the x, I can simply find the root of this equation to uh, find out the x, and that gives me the second limit. And uh, as you can probably see that this can be extended to find a collision attack also. There, instead of taking m0 m1 at the beginning and taking a fixed stage, we simply take two variable messages where the variable message uh, so should give us the same value. So we only differ the two blocks in the first uh, two blocks of messages in the first block and construct the two polynomials p x and p prime x, and then simply compute the root of the difference of these two polynomials, and uh, that's how we get the collision. And uh, in the paper, we actually give the complexities by measuring uh, or estimating the complexities up to the round constants. Uh, sorry, up to the complexity constants uh, for the different processes, namely. Uh, GCD or um, root finding or uh, polynomial construction, etc. And uh, one of the things to notice here is that we have only considered the hash function where the hash output is constructed out of one branch. So one interesting problem for future would be that how do you apply this method or how can you extend this efficiently when you, the hash is constructed out of two branches, let's say. 
So that concludes my talk about the article. Thank you. Thanks, Anup and everyone. We now have about. Um, Anup, can you mute your your mic? Thanks. Uh, okay, so we now have uh, something like 20 minutes or so for questions. So if you have any questions, please post them in the chat or on Zulip. We already have the first questions from the audience there. So the first question we have was posted for Fule. And uh, Ting Ting is asking, why do you add such three constraints in the search process? Uh, and uh, she's wondering what will happen if you relax these constraints. For example, if you set the number of active S boxes to be less than six instead of less than five. Well, I think the main reason is the restriction of the search time. And if we re if we relax the constraints, um, I don't know. Maybe some better results can be can be achieved. And uh, we verify our results with the MRLP, MILP method to search the five-round five best results on the full search space. And the results is, uh, is, is exactly the same with the results of algorithm one. But there is uh, no more experimental verification. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we already have, uh, we also have a question for Kose, where Christian Rechberger is asking, do you plan to create instances with smaller block sizes in the future? Would you expect that there are improvements, for example, over existing 64-bit block size constructions with your approach? So there's no, so there's no plan with smaller block size. So, um, So we, uh, for existing 64-bit block size construction, uh, so I, sorry, I can't, sorry, I can't uh, answer, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe a different question. So have you done a comparison of your cipher with some of the block ciphers in the NIST lightweight competition? Do you have some? numbers on how much or how your algorithm performs compared to block ciphers or tweakable block ciphers in this competition or to other lightweight block ciphers? So, uh, so I can answer your question in English. So okay. could you repeat your question more, sorry. Yeah, I was wondering um, whether you did a comparison of the performance of your cipher, like energy consumption and uh, area, with some other lightweight block ciphers. Uh, so what is so uh, what is a uh, most uh, smaller block size cipher? And energy mm -hmm. consumption is uh, competitive is uh, middle, 128. So that's okay, okay, so that's a, a good result then since Midori was already optimized for, for energy. Um, I don't see any other um, questions currently on Zulip, so I will ask a few more on, on my own. Uh, maybe for JP. Um, so you used your a uh, tool to analyze uh, some direct search problems for Cypher, such as finding the key or finding pre-images. Do you think that your tool or your approach can also be used for uh, other tasks, like for example, finding differential paths, similar to Satsolvers, which are also more used for other purposes and not direct search problems? That is, uh, yes, we do believe that. And it's actually one of the things we're working on right now is to uh, change the model into uh, looking for linear holes and differential uh, trails. And, yeah, just have to do the modeling part of the S-boxes differently, uh, we believe. But we're not, it's still a work in progress. Mm -hmm. uh, you also said in your talk that one of the main problems is the memory consumption of the approach. 
So um, can you give us an intuition after how much time or so do you run out of memory? So is it like you wait three days and then it runs out or what runtime did you consider in your in your example? Well, this is this is one of the open questions is, is actually when to hit this, this tipping point that we briefly mentioned or when you run out of it. Because we know that the, what we call the solver, the, the way we choose which order to resolve the independencies and to join together compressed right side equations uh, is actually suboptimal. We know that there are papers that have done, looked at the same ciphers we looked at and get a better result with lower memory consumption. So in theory, I could ask the like answer at this one right now, but we want to optimize it. We want to improve it. We know there's a lot of potential there. So it, it probably wouldn't probably wouldn't be uh, very accurate, but currently I guess between half an hour and uh, two hours is when you'd, you'd hit this, this point of, uh, yeah. Hmm. Of course, depending on how, how much memory you have. So I guess we should look forward to your next uh, publications then concerning applications to other problems and optimization. I hope so too. Um, <laughs> okay, maybe a question to Arnab. So um, you proposed this uh, attack for uh, GMMC um, and, and in different scenarios. Do you think your analysis approach is also relevant for some of the other ciphers you listed in the beginning, which are optimized for similar um, performance characteristics? Um, well, I, I think that this can be uh, tested for Poseidon uh, easily by looking at the uh, round uh, degree propagation and also the algebraic form. But I'm not sure about the legendary form. I, I don't see how it can be applied directly or even uh, other constructions which do not use such algebraic structure. But the polynomial computation gives some nice form. Uh, there, I do not see how it can be applied directly. Mm -hmm. And um, can you maybe give a bit of a summary how your analysis compares to the analysis the designers or other third party analysts did? So, how many uh, rounds or so do you gain with, with your approach? Uh, so, it, it does not actually contradict the security of the original design. It only, uh, what it does is that. Uh, with the recent uh, Eurocrypt paper where it was mostly for the uh, zero-sum distinguish and collision compared to that we uh, gain something, but again this gain, uh, I should not compare it and this is what uh, we wrote in the article also because of the output type of the hash that we have chosen, uh, which I said at the end that either I can choose it from one branch or I can choose it from two branches, the hash output, so if I do not look at this part, then we have some advantage, but then I do not think it's a nice uh, comparison, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so we still have uh, about 12 minutes left and are running out of questions on Zulip, so please post your own. Um, I do have a few more, so maybe we'll continue with those in the meantime. Uh, maybe for Lorenzo. Uh, so you present these weak key distinguishers for AES. Um, did you have a look at um, how well these distinguishers are distinguishable in the sense, how can you use them to, to set up something like a key recovery or to use them um, maybe in, in a compression function construction or so? Do you think that would work? That's a good question. So for the key recovery attack, we didn't set up any key recovery attack. And the main reason is that uh, the set of wikis is quite small. So, um, Probably a brute force attack would be better in that case. For, uh, for the case of uh, hash function, um, for example, the hash function based on the Davis Mary construction or something like that. So, using the multiple of eight properties, this multiple of n property seems quite hard. But uh, we propose some attack, some collision attack, I think, yeah, uh, using uh, a classical truncative differential distinguisher. So, we consider a Davis Mary construction with uh, seven or eight round, yes, 256, and we propose some collision attack. In, in that case. So the, the approach in general seems to be extensible for, for attacks on, on a higher level mode, but not necessarily in the, the current one with the few weak keys. Do I get that right? Yeah, especially for the key recovery attack. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, maybe another question for uh, Tinting. 
So you presented these uh, attacks on Zoof and some of the attacks, uh, some of the algebraic attacks worked by setting up an equation system and then linearizing it so that you can solve it with Gauss Gaussian elimination. Do you think it could be a good approach to use some other nonlinear equation solving technique, like for example, um, Gribner basis or sub solvers? Yes, we, we can see that about other uh, methods and maybe it will be work. Uh, but yeah, in the, in the future work, we may, we may be focused on it. But now uh, we are not familiar with other, other solver, I think. <laughs> it's easy to solve the linear equation system. So we do this. And easy means it's also not so expensive? Yeah. Or easy to evaluate the runtime? Yes. This is probably a big advantage of, of linearization that it's much easier to get a runtime estimation uh, than for the other yeah. techniques. Yes, it's easy to evaluate the time complexity and the memory uh, complexity, I think. Mm. Maybe another question for Fule. So um, you looked at these clustering effects for the differential case. Do you think that some of the observations you made are also relevant for linear attacks on GIFT? So do you expect something like a linear Hull effect? Uh, yeah, actually, um, I haven't searched the clustering effect of uh, linear trials because um, in the linear situation, I think the, it is much more complicated but I think it will be worth it to try. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's actually, I think, a good uh, final word. It's complicated, but it's worth trying. Uh, that I think applies to many of the questions that we heard in the uh, question set session. So um, if anybody wants another quick question, please speak up now. Um, There's one otherwise... for Lorenzo on Zulu, I think. Uh... Oh, I didn't see that one. Uh, so Fu Kang asks, will it be more meaningful for a weak key distinguisher if the time complexity of the distinguisher is lower than the number of weak keys? I found the time complexity of the distinguisher in this paper is higher than the number of weak keys. Did I miss something? Mm, no, I don't think this is the case. So, um, um, I mean, potentially uh, a weak key distinguisher, so a chosen key distinguisher or a non-key distinguisher, no, sorry, a chosen key distinguisher could work also for a single key. Is a quite extreme case, but uh, um, for, for the open key distinguisher, there is no restriction on the keys, on the size of the keys for which the property holds. Uh, for the case of secret key distinguisher, yeah, so um, it makes sense that the size of the key is smaller than the size of the of the of the subspace. Um, so in the paper we propose this property is as property of uh, round reducer yes rather than secret key distinguisher starting point for Diego attack. Are there any other questions I overlooked? I just checked, but I didn't see any. I don't see any more on Zulu right now. <laughs> okay. Um, then um, let's uh, thank all the uh, speakers of the session again and all the other contributors, in particular the questioners, and see you again for the next session.